commercial and recreational fishing is regulated. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're all in fishing zones. It depends on the area. And I'll go over what different areas are in California. Um, but what is not regulated is non-consumptive use. So non-consumptive uses are things like surfing and scuba diving and swimming and snorkeling, packing, everything that you're just out there to enjoy, you're not taking anything away. So in California, we have three types of MPAs. We have state marine reserves, where all fishing and resource extraction is prohibited. So these are the most restrictive. Um, this is also where marine life usually is kind of um, grow and reproduce because it's completely protected. Um, from a conservation standpoint, those are those are the most beneficial environmentally. And then there's state marine parks where certain recreational fishing is allowed. Um, so they might allow for hook and line fishermen on shore, or it might allow for spear fishermen who are like free diving to fish there. And then a state marine conservation area is where some recreational and some commercial um, activity is allowed. So um, where are MPAs? I, I can tell you guys that if, if any of you have spent time in the ocean, even if it's abroad or here, you've likely done a lot of that in MPAs. Do you guys know if any of you have been in a marine protected area? No? So if you've been to Hawaii and they took you on like a snorkeling trip, or in Mexico, or um, uh, especially Australia, usually they take people to marine protected areas because that's where they're gonna, you're going to see more fish and see bigger ones. So they're all over the world. This map is more than five years old, so even today there's even more MPAs around. Some areas that have really good series of MPAs are like Australia along the Great Barrier Reef. There's a lot in the Mediterranean. Um, in the Caribbean, we have more that are growing. And then over there in, Cal in, over there in where we are in California, um, our marine protected areas are growing. So basically, MPAs are a conservation tool. And I mentioned some of this already, but um, basically, in MPAs, over time we see bigger fish, we see more fish, we see high, higher species di uh, diversity, which means more different species, and specific fish species can grow and reproduce. So, like lobster. You see the lobster in this picture. Um, I took that picture out at Anacapa Island, at the Channel Islands, and this is what we kind of call a lobster condo, because there's just dozens of lobsters <coughs> in these little caves. But if you go outside, outside a marine reserve, you don't usually see something like this because you know, usually they get picked off by fishermen. So this is something that basically you see that if you go right inside an MPA versus outside, there's a huge difference in uh, fish species. Um, so here's the science behind MPAs. Um, this group called PISCO is a partnership for interdisciplinary studies of, of coastal oceans, and it's basically UC Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, Stanford, a bunch of different um, universities that send researchers out around the world to study MPAs. Um, so they reviewed 124 marine reserves around the whole world, reserves being those ones where no fishing is allowed, and they found that biomass had increased by 446%. Um, they found that density increased by 166%. These are huge numbers, right? We're not talking about like, you know, there's 10% more fish. We're talking, you know, a lot more. Um, the body size of animals increased by 28% and diversity increased by 21%. And as I mentioned before, the fish species showed the most notable increases. Um, locally at the Channel Islands, have any of you ever seen anything or are familiar with the Channel Islands? They're, they're right off California. Basically, they're off kind of Santa Barbara, Ventura area. Um, so we have, if you've never been out there, even if you don't scuba dive, but you'd like to go on the top. There's great hiking, they're beautiful. Um, most of them nobody lives out there except for sometimes researchers. So they're pretty um, pretty great if you're a nature lover, especially if you want to see. There's some animals that live out there that you can't find anywhere else. They're endemic to just living on one island. Um, so there's Channel Island foxes. But underwater, there's a great um, set of ecosystems of kelp forests that support um, rocky reef out there we've had MPAs in place um, for a little bit and after five years they studied the difference from before they had MPAs and after and they found that increased biomass, larger marine life, uh, higher species density, fish were one and a half times greater than it, um, in reserves than outside of them. They found that the kelp forests were healthier and the 
then these are two other things if you're if you're interested in the economics or how fishermen were doing. Um, they actually found that sport fishing increased in the area because they were having more <coughs> fish just outside MPAs as well because they were spilling over. Um, also, commercial uh, commercial fishermen were seeing an increase in catch as well. So even though these red areas were off limits to fishing, which meant there's less area that fishermen could go, they actually found that their fishermen was doing better. It wasn't doing worse. Um, another example of this is um, out of Massachusetts. So have you guys maybe heard of, of cod? You know, cod, there was like a big fisheries um, crash in the early 90s. And so, pe so many people ate cod and all of a sudden there weren't very many left. And so off Massachusetts, they set up these um, marine reserves, so those are the yellow areas, which are didn't allow for any fishing. And then they had all the boats that were fishing out there put little GPS recorders on where they were going, and those are all the spots on the map. So the areas that are um, yellow and red are where the boats frequented the most often, like where they spent the most time. And what do you notice in that map? Where, where are most of those yellow and orange and red um, dots? Are they along the MPAs? Yeah, so they're fishing along the line. And that's likely because you know, the inside the MPAs, the fish are basically, you know, reaching carrying capacity and kind of expanding out of the MPAs, so the fishermen are having better catch right along the edges. So that's called fishing the line. In California, um, in 1999, a law was passed called the Marine Life Protection Act. Um, and this law has been supported and approved by, you know, different governors in our state, whether they're Republican or Democrat. Um, but the problem is that it just took a while to get actually implement this law. A lot of things in politics take um, a little while to actually go forward. So in 2008, the MLPA process started in Southern California. Um, the goal of the MLPA was to have a statewide network of MPAs by 2011. So as of last year, we're supposed to have around, um, the whole state. Um, we almost have that. We, they still need to get them up in Northern California, which should happen in the next couple months. And then eventually they'll have them in San Francisco Bay. Um, but they already have them in place on the whole central coast. So basically from San Francisco south, um, we have a series of MPAs in place. And this was a private-public partnership. And just for interest, see this picture right here in the middle? That fish is, is called a giant black sea bass. It's actually an endangered species that we have up here in California. That's, that's I'm the diver in the picture, and that's out at Catalina Island. And these fish, I mean, they can be as big as a VW bug. They can be as big as a car. Um, but, you know, early, earlier um, in the 1900s, they were fish because they're just a big fish that, you know, seems pretty docile, so you know, it's easy pickings for fishermen, and their population plummeted. Um, they were protected, and they still are protected from any kind of fishing, and now we're seeing their population numbers go up. But the cool thing is that just off California, off a couple spots along the coast and out at Catalina Island, they, um, they all come together at certain times to mate. And so we might get like, out in the water, there are probably about 20 fish that this big at the same time. And they're all there just to do, um, to, you know, make babies. <laughs> so if you're a diver, if, you, if you're around this summer, I, I, I recommend getting up to Catalina and trying to see these guys. Huge. Right, this slide's a little hard to see, but basically this Green Life Protection Act process, and I said it was a private and public partnership, it involved the government, so things like the California State Fish and Game Commission, the California Department of Fish and Game, but it also included um, regional stakeholder groups. And these were surfers and divers and fishermen and um, kayakers and business and anybody who had a concern or a stake in, in seeing part of our coast protected. And um, these dozens of stakeholders met and came up with the maps and the regulations and the locations that they'd like to see these MPAs. And this went over the, the process of a couple years. Then there was a science advisory team that would come in and give recommendations. And then it all had to be approved by Blue River Task Force and then kind of thought up the ranks. But the point is, is that instead of like in other countries, I've seen a president basically make a decree and say, okay, this area is the marine protected area, no fishing allowed. And the locals feel really, you know, left out. You know, they've just, they've just been told what to do and they didn't have any say in it. But in California, we got to have, and there were, there were dozens of public meetings, so if people weren't on the stakeholders group, the public got to come out and actually give their opinion. What were they supporting? Where would they like to see? Why did they care? Um, I, 
to several of those meetings, and there, there, some of them had uh, thousands of people at them. So the, one of the last ones in San Diego, over a thousand people were in this big room, and you know, it took all day for everybody to give their comments. But it shows how many people care about our local ocean. Uh, so the previous phases in um, the South Central Coast. So if you're familiar with like San Luis Obispo or um, Morro Bay. Santa Cruz. Um, those were all on the South Central and North Central Coast, and those were put into place earlier than the South Coast, and they got a different series of marine protected areas. And so when it moved to Southern California, um, you know, it was good because it already been set up on the Central Coast. And so now, as of January 1st of this year, we have 15% of Southern California's waters are in MPAs. So this includes 36 brand new MPAs, around 12% of these MPAs are in um, marine reserves, which means that you know, they're the most um, restrictive. And 3% are in the partially protected conservation areas. So I'm going to show you a map of basically where they are. So we're kind of, you see where it says Los Angeles, we're just north of there here, Pasadena. But um, so locally, where it says Point Doom, that's up in Malibu. So we have a good um, little MPA cluster there. We have the map at Palos Verdes. And then we have a lot of other islands. And if you go down to Orange County, you have a good amount in Laguna, there's some down in San Diego, and some, some up in Santa Barbara. So the idea was that they made a network. So it's not just what you're putting out there, but if there's a network, you're protecting not just the actual fish that are living there and the invertebrates and the, and the other marine life, but you're also protecting um, and giving a chance for more larvae to um, basically seed the ocean. And so by protect, protecting areas that are right on the points, kind of can see the whole area in between. So uh, how, how many of you have ever been to Malibu? Maybe to the beach out there? So if you've never gone out there, I mean, and for those of you that have, you know, it's beautiful beaches. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to, to Zuma Beach, Point Doom, Point Doom. So that's the area that's in the new marine protected area.
Um, out at Catalina Island, we also have more um, MPAs. And so, uh, the next step, as I said, January 1st of this year, um, the South Coast MPAs were implemented. So the Department of Fish and Game enforces these MPAs. Um, no, the citizens don't or anything, but citizens and research groups and, and nonprofits and academic institutions, we're all doing the monitoring because these MPAs will be reviewed every five years. They're going to look at all the data that different groups have collected and they'll adjust these MPAs depending on what they feel is uh, necessary. So this is called adaptive management. Um, so for instance, uh, our group is doing beach-based human use monitoring. I'll get into that in a little bit. Other groups are doing marine life monitoring. Um, so if you're a scuba diver, you can volunteer with Reef Check and they'll train you to do basically counting fish and invertebrates underwater. And there's also socioeconomic monitoring. That's a little over So what does this mean for you? Um, you live in Southern California. You know, are you going to be able to surf in these places? And basically, you can still swim and surf and sail and dive, do all those non-consumptive activities anywhere on the coast. Um, but there's no fishing allowed in marine reserves and limited fishing in the conservation areas. So there's just certain areas where it's restricted. Like I said, it's less than 15% of the coast. So in other words, 85% of our coast is still open to fishing. Also, there's volunteer opportunities with Hill Bay with other organizations. So I'm going to go into one of the um, volunteer opportunities that we have at Hill Bay that have to do with MPAs. Um, this is a picture out actually out at Point Doom of the um, Kai Pooling area. So MPA Watch, um, I got the idea from this because there was a uh, group doing a similar program on the Central Coast. Basically, they have volunteers being trained to go out as citizen scientists and collecting da data on how people, go, what do people go to the beach to do? Are they going to the beach to go fishing, to go surfing, to dive, just to do general recreation? Nobody has been collecting this data. And I'll go through why it's important, but I thought this would be a good way to involve the community again with monitoring our MPAs. Um, so basically, volunteers get trained. They can produce accurate and reliable information. This will help us to understand how individuals use coastal areas. And then this data can be used to inform management and, monitorings and monitoring of MPAs. So um, the need, you know, we're not going to start a program just for, because it's a good idea, but it has to be a need for it. Um, so we thought that, you know, Department of Fish and Game has a big, <coughs> big challenge on their hands. You know, they have to now enforce all these marine areas. And, you know, the state budget, you know, they probably don't have as much money or, or personnel to do it as, as they would ideally. So we thought that it would be a good idea to give them our data, and then they can basically see, you know, is there fishing going on in an area that's not supposed to? And if it is, maybe they can target um, more of the wardens to go out and enforce there. Um, another thing is that we can document change in use before and after implementation. So this means, you know, are more people kayaking and scuba diving in MPAs than before? Are more people actually just going to the beach in MPAs? Is it, is it a tourist attraction? Um, also, we'll look at trends in human use, uh, just in the general area. We'll also look at it with biological data. So if they're just counting the fish and look at the marine populations, but nobody's been documenting it getting the full picture because humans are basically the biggest player in these marine systems. So our data with the biological can give a, a whole picture. Um, so that's just an example of a fishing boat, me and my brother diving at Catalina. Um, so this is point two, and this is in the this is very early spring, late winter when the um, flowers are starting to bloom. So basically, volunteers with MPA Watch, they walk along the beach surveying um, all, all people, whatever people are out there and what activities they're doing. So it's observational data. So they're out there with the clipboard and just writing down. They're not you know, approaching people and asking. And so the volunteers will complete data sheets. If the public asks them questions, they can educate the public on what they're doing. Um, and different activities that they're recording are <coughs> different types of fishing. So like both commercial and recreational. So during training, I train all the volunteers to identify like what a commercial lobster fishing boat looks like to what a spear fisherman looks like. And so they, they know what they look like and they have a field manual. 
Um, but we're also tracking non-consumptive uses, so are people out there staying at paddle boarding or surfing or wildlife watching? And we're actually having some cities approach us now because they're interested in having this data as well. Um, so the two areas that we survey are health producing Malibu because that's where the MPAs are. We do it inside the MPAs and just outside them, so we have control areas. So if you've st ever studied how to put together a science experiment, you know, usually you have you know, your study area and then you have a control area. Um, and then also this has now expanded to other parts of Southern California. So Santa Barbara Channel Keeper is now starting to do this up in Santa Barbara. And Orange <coughs> County is starting to expand it and also San Diego. So um, basically, if you want to be involved as a volunteer, they're basically just walking down pretty beaches for less than an hour collecting data. If you're just a volunteer for the MPA watch, you can let me know. If you want to do different scuba diving research, there's also opportunities for that. Or if you'd like to volunteer in our aquarium, either educating kids or um, doing aquarist studies, you can let me know and I can identify uh, what would be good for you because any questions? And then um, some are from looking at fundraisers. So like for me specifically running the program, um, in the MPA Watch program, I got a grant. My, my boss and I wrote a grant to help support it. We had a small startup one from the USC Sea Grant to start it up, but now we have one from um, Resources Design Sea Fund Foundation. And so then the rest of my work, so the other, so this, so MPA Watch is half my job. The other half of my job is working on those other marine and coastal issues. Most of that just comes from our like fundraisers and membership donations. And the volunteering hours are in any time you need. Yeah, so the volunteer hours, it's completely up to you. We're very flexible. It's any day of the week, any time when it's daylight. Um, we ask volunteers to do a minimum of uh, four surveys a month. Um, so often some volunteers will just go out and do that all one day, or they'll go out two different days. Um, some people will do it, you know, they'll kind of do it before they go to work or before they go to school in the morning walk on the beach or they'll do it afterwards or on weekends. And it's, I, I think our volunteers are really enjoying it. They're not out there like enforcing it to look, so there's no confrontation. It's more just trying to help, you know, um, basically manage these MPAs. Okay, and we started from that. What I forgot to mention is Heal the Bay started from just having a handful of local people and volunteers to now we have over 50 employees. We have first, and I think that's because, first of all, there's a lot of opportunities for local to be involved and volunteer. So we also run internship programs. I forgot to mention that. Is that so if you want to go into education or development, which means like fundraising or marketing, we have uh, internship opportunities there. But then I also do internships with the science and policy department. So usually I have four interns from different universities and colleges, and they do different research projects. They also help me with the MPA Watch program. So there's different internship opportunities as well for college students. MPA Watch, um, the locations are in Palos Springs and Malibu. So depending on where you live and what time of day you go, you know, technically what we're like, I think less than 30 miles from the, from Palos Verdes here, but if you go at, when it's bad traffic, it can take a long time. I'll give you my card. Actually, can I do it? Do the paper?